Hi guys, this is the first video on coastal landscape development. We will be learning about characteristic coastal landscapes and the origin and development of landforms of coastal erosion. First of all, we're going to learn about characteristic coastal landscapes. And this is a photograph of a very well-known coast in Dorset, where we have very kind of distinct coastal features. So we're going to learn about some of these features in this video. So firstly, to give a brief introduction to coastlines, coastlines are where the land meets the sea and they also don't have one specific landscape or single landscape. Coastal zones tend to be made up of a variety of different features and not all coasts have the same combination of features. They all can be very different. And all the features tend to reflect different factors in the environment, such as the climate, the nature of the tides and waves, and also the coastal geology and lithology, which relates to the different types of rock and how the rock is structured in the area. And this is important because different rocks are more and less resistant to erosion. So that's why we get lots of different types of landforms forming. So we also have different classifications of coastlines. So we don't need to go into detail about this, but coastlines can be either classified as concordant or discordant. We just need to know those names. They can be emergent or submergent. And we can also have clift coast, flat coast or graded shorelines. And those oral factors we'll be learning about in different videos, but we don't need to know much about them right now. And also, we will have different characteristics of different coastlines. Firstly, depending on whether the coast is a high energy or a low energy coast, this relates to wave energy. Where we have higher wave energy, we'll have a high energy coast and we'll have greater erosion. And low energy coast will find more features of deposition. And another characteristic and which will affect the landforms present will be whether the area is more or less intensely managed by people. So some areas of coastland, they're uninhabited and they're kind of really left to nature to take over, whereas other places are kind of very much inhabited and full of human activities. And this relates back to whether we have coastlines dominated by erosion or deposition, which relates back to whether we have a high or a low energy coast. The first type of landforms we're going to look at are headlands and bays. And this is a photograph here of Lulworth Cove in South Purbeck on the Dorset coast. And this is a typical bay and it also has an associated headland feature. And we're going to look about at how these different headlands and bays are formed as they're very significant features in the coastal landscape. So this is just a map I've drawn of the Purbeck area. And this is the cove that was just in the photograph we saw. And this is a piece of headland called Durdle Door just further up the coast. And what we can see is that in this coastal landscape, we have different types of rock present. And these really influence the formation of these different landforms. So as you can see, right on the edge of the coast, we have Portland stone. Further in, we have the Purbeck beds. We then have Weldon beds, green sand and chalk. And the different erosion rates of these different types of rock and stone will affect the rates of erosion and deposition in the areas. So going back to the Purbeck coast, we're going to kind of analyse the map which I just showed you. So the map is showing the impact of geology on the coastline, as I mentioned before. And we have areas of more and less resistant rock, which create the common features of the coves or bays and the headlands. And where we have the less resistant rock, this is where our bays are going to form, because these are areas where we have less resistant rock, so more erosion can take place. And in these areas, we also have low energy waves where bays are formed. So sediment is allowed to be accumulated rather than eroded away. And this forms beaches, which tend to protect the coastline from erosion. Whereas on the other hand, headlands are formed where we have pieces of more resistant rock. So less erosion is taking place and we have wave refraction as well, a process we learned about before, where we have wave energy hitting the coast in a certain direction onto a piece of headland. So the headlands are susceptible to higher wave energy because they stick out from the coastline. And headlands are created where we have highest energy waves 
and as I said they're more vulnerable to erosion than bays because they stick out off the coastline so the waves hit them first so they're more susceptible. So to look at this map again, here the reason why Durdle Door sticks out on the coast is because it's made of more resistant rock. And so this part of the coastline where we have the chalk, chalk is much softer. So as you can see, it's been eroded back much faster or at a faster rate than this bit here, which is the headland. So the headland's almost been left behind, sticking out. And where we have Lulworth Cove, that's where we've had a piece, an area of less resistant rock and the ocean has slowly eroded and caused the formation of this cove on the edge of the coast. But we have pieces of resistant rock on either side which have eroded less quickly and so they still kind of remain there and that's why we've had this area of cove which has been kind of carved out from the original geology which would have originally covered this whole piece of coastline. So now that we've learned about that we're going to look at the formation of headlands and bays in more detail. So one of the characteristics that we need for the formation of headlands and bays is geology that's running parallel to the coast. So as we saw on the map, all the rock is lying parallel to the coast, kind of in horizontal strata. And it's marine processes that are creating our headlands and bays. So coastal systems are systems and therefore we can look at them with a system approach, looking at the inputs, processes and outputs. So the inputs into our system for the formation of headlands and bays include the geology, which is the type of rock that I mentioned before, with having softer or harder rocks, which are more or less resistant to erosion. The angle of the dip, I mentioned this in another video, where this is the kind of angle of the rocks, where we have steeper cliff faces like this with horizontal strata. They are eroded much more easily in comparison to places where we have a dip of a less steep angle and this is eroded less easily. Also the nature of the waves, if we have high energy waves there's going to be more erosion and lower energy waves less erosion and also the strength of the wind, higher winds more erosion and weaker winds less erosion. So those are our inputs into our systems for creating headlands and bays. And then the processes, so the processes relate to the rate of erosion of the rocks where we have higher rates of erosion, this is where we're going to form bays because bays are erosional features and where we have less erosion that's when headlands will start to form as they are left behind. Also wave refraction which is occurring on pieces of headland and this is causing erosion of the headlands and also we get deposition in our bays because when the water or the waves enter into our bay areas they tend to lose energy very quickly and then for their sediment or sand is deposited on beaches within our bays. These are very sheltered areas, whereas the waves will be hitting the coastline with greater force out here. And then the outputs to our systems are the formation of the headlands and bays, and the outputs tend to be the characteristics of the coast. So we have our erosional features of our headlands and our depositional features, which are our bays because this is where sand is being deposited to form beaches. The next set of landforms we're going to look at are cliffs and wave cut platforms, which we can see in this photograph here. This whole section of rock here is called a wave cut platform, and these are the cliffs behind it. And we're going to look at how these are formed now. So to form a wave cut platform, which we saw in that photograph here, we have a series of processes which work together to form this very distinct structure. And I'll be using this diagram here to explain the process. So the first stage in our process is that high energy waves or very steep waves break at the foot of the cliff. And this causes concentrated erosion at the base of the cliff and undercuts the cliff. So this is what we can see happening here. This would be the original line of our cliff and the waves would be hitting the cliff at the bottom here with very high energy and this causes the rock to be undercut and makes what's called a wave cut notch. Now the erosion increases stress on the cliff above and this causes the cliff to collapse over time. So as you can see, the cliff is retreating over time 
because these pieces of rock will collapse and fall down. Then finally, this causes the retreat of the cliff line and it creates a gently sloping platform of about less than five degrees, which we can see here, forming a wave cut platform, which is this area here, which is left behind after the cliff has eroded. So originally the cliff would have come up to this point here, but it has eroded back over time as the waves have eroded backwards. And this leaves quite a rough surface. So our wave cut platforms, as we can see in this photograph here, are not very smooth. It's important to know they have very rough features and a rough surface. And also after the initial wave cut platform has been formed, rates of erosion tend to reduce over time. And this slows down the formation of the wave cut platform because initially when the cliffs would have been out here, the waves would have been hitting them directly. However, now that the cliffs have retreated back to this point here, the waves are actually breaking much farther away from the coastline. Therefore, we get decreased erosion because the waves aren't actually hitting the cliffs now. So that is the formation of wave cut platforms. And finally, the last features we're going to look at in this video are the formation of geos, caves, blowholes, arches and stacks, which are all related features and they all form from each other through a series of processes. And we can see this happening in this photograph here, where we'll look at this in more detail. But here down here, we have geos and blowholes forming caves. And here we have our arches and our stacks which are separated and out in the water. And these all form from the erosion of the cliff over time. So we'd start off with a small cave here, which would eventually become a stack at the end. So I'm gonna look into how these are formed in more detail. So to begin with, we have a small crack in the rock in a cliff, which is attached to the headland and over time, this crack is going to be widened through processes like hydraulic action, which is the force of the water hitting the crack and air being pressurized into the crack, causing it to widen. Then over time, this small crack will widen to form a cave through kind of a, a weathering process. And um, we also have forms of chemical weathering taking place, such as crystallization and dry weathering. And this affects chalk and chalk is not a very resistant rock, so it's eroded very easily. So these features form very readily over time. And over time, these cracks are going to widen and become bigger and bigger through the processes of things like hydraulic action from wave energy and so on. And these notches will then deepen to form caves. And over time, these will then grow even larger. And what happens to form these arches, as we can see here, is that sometimes there will be a cave forming on the other side of the cliff. And when these are eroded even further, they join up in the middle and then we get arches forming where the wave completely cuts through the rock and forms an arch. And then over time, this piece of rock here will be eroded even further until it becomes really, really unstable and the top of this rock here will then collapse and we will be left with a stack which is completely cut off from the mainland as the cliff becomes even more eroded. And over time, the stack, which is shown here, will then be eroded even further and will be eroded mostly by the wind and it will be reduced in height to form a stump. So this is the process of forming from a geo to a stump and this all happens over time. And this is our final product. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-level geography a walk in the park.